Hey guys, Jared Beckwith here. I'm a registered EEG technologist, and in today's video, I'm gonna show how I describe an EEG for a neurologist. So let's say I just hook up an EEG, bunch of electrodes on the scalp, start to record the brain. How do I describe what I'm seeing to the doctor? Now it's the doctor's job to read it, but it can't hurt to give them a little short description, like kind of like a pre-report so they know what they're getting into when they have to go through and read the whole study that you record for them. So the first thing you're gonna wanna put in your report is the patient state. Is the patient awake? Are they alert? Are they oriented? How do you determine this? Well, you just observe and then ask the patient very simple questions. Hey, what's your name? Date of birth? Where are you right now? Who's the president? Maybe have them do some simple math problems. Don't give them too, anything too crazy. After taking note of the patient's overall mental state for the doctor, then you're gonna to wanna to look into the actual EEG waveforms. So first, is it continuous? The best way to see is it continuous, the best example of that is a normal EEG. I'll show you that here. Very continuous, it's happening you know, with, without stopping. Now the best example of a discontinuous EEG to an extreme example would be a burst suppression pattern where you have little bursts of activity and then a big flat line in between, and then a burst of activity again. So that is discontinuous, and a normal EEG is continuous. So that's the first thing to take note of. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to look at, is it symmetric? So comparing both the left and the right sides of the brain, are they symmetric? Are they even on both sides of the brain? Some things that could cause some asymmetry would be, let's say they had a tumor in one area or they had a stroke in one area, that could cause slowing of the EEG waves in that specific area. Or another thing, let's say they had some type of brain surgery or even in my examples, a patient had a gunshot wound in one area, so there's like an opening in the skull and that can cause higher amplitude waves in that specific area, making it asymmetric, not symmetric. The next major thing you're gonna to wanna to take note of is the posterior dominant rhythm. Is it reactive? You can just have the patient close their eyes and you'll see a nice eight to 12 waves per second in a normal patient. And when they open their eyes, the eight to 12 waves per second in the back of the head, O1 and O2, it's gonna disappear. And that is a normal reactive posterior dominant rhythm. That's what you wanna see. So just to recap, for a normal patient, this sample patient, you'd say in your report, this patient is awake, alert, oriented with a continuous, symmetric, reactive, nine hertz, nine waves per second, posterior dominant rhythm. That's a good start. Now, what would you go into next? Next, you would do some, include some activation procedures. As the EEG technologist, you'd show the patient a flashing light and with each one of the flashes, there's gonna be a wave in the back of the head corresponding with each flash, that's gonna be called photic driving. So it's normal to have photic driving, but it's also normal not to have it. If there was a wave corresponding with each flash, you would include bilateral photic driving in the report. And another thing you do as an EEG technologist for activation procedures, you can have the patient hyperventilate. Some patients hyperventilation won't be applicable, like patients who've had a stroke or high blood pressure, or other, some other few diseases, but you're gonna wanna hyperventilate, especially children who have staring off in space episodes, you're gonna wanna have them hyperventilate to provoke one of those staring off seizures, which are called absence seizures. Now, you'd have them hyperventilate for three minutes, and a normal response, you'll see the slowing on the EEG generalized throughout the whole, the whole thing, once the patient has been hyperventilating for like two and a half minutes, you'll see the slowing start to appear and you might even see a seizure. Three hertz spike and wave if it's an absence seizure. And you can make note of that for the doctor and you can test the patient's consciousness during the, the spike and wave activity. Really interesting stuff, guys. Now, some patients won't have the buildup, the generalized slowing after the hyperventilation, but just make note of it for the doctor. It's still normal. Depends on the patient's effort with the hyperventilation too. Also make note of that for the doctor. And other than hyperventilation, after doing that, I like to have the patient try to get some sleep in a routine EEG so we can see them awake, drowsy, asleep, 
the first few sleep stages, one through two, that would be very, that would be a very successful EEG, I would say. So you can make note of the sleep stages. One and two are very important to recognize because you'll see those a lot in routine EEGs. And stage three and REM, those are important if you're doing long-term continuous monitoring of patients. But for if you're just doing routine EEGs, you get real familiar with stage one sleep, see some vertex waves, and stage two sleep, you can start to see some sleep spindles. It just takes a little bit of time to get used to seeing them. It's also good to capture sleep on the EEG because some patients' abnormalities are only brought out while they're sleeping. So very important thing to try and get the patient at least a little bit of sleep, even though it's uncomfortable with all those wires on their head and they probably only have like 20 minutes to fall asleep. If you can get just a little bit of sleep, that may make a major change in the patient's treatment and their outcome. It, you may prevent them from having to do another long-term 72-hour EEG if you can just capture what you need to capture in the short 30-minute record. But sometimes there's nothing you can do. All we can do is do our best, guys. The last two things when doing a report on an EEG for a doctor are to include any abnormalities. Number one, any focal slowing, any slow waves in one specific area in the brain. Now that would either come from a stroke, a past stroke, or any tumors, something like that, slowing in one specific area. Now when reading the EEG, it's also good to take in the patient's other history. Have they had any MRIs, any CAT scans? Were there any abnormalities on those? Because if they had a past MRI or CAT scan and they saw that there was some, let's say, mesial temporal sclerosis on the left temporal lobe, you may see left temporal focal slowing on the EEG. So that's one thing that I really take into account now. When I first started, I was thinking just EEG, just EEG. But looking through the patient's history can actually give you valuable insight as to what to expect when you actually read the EEG. You get a full big picture seeing the other patient's tests as well. The last thing you need to know is any epileptic activity. How prevalent is it? Is it occasional, frequent, abundant? How often is it happening? And where is it happening? Is it happening in the left temporal region? Is it the right temporal region? Is it in the center? Is it in the frontal area? That's up for you guys to determine. Let's say you see a start of a seizure, start of some spike and wave epileptic activity you'll label it on the EEG, EEG start, also clinical start. Clinical is any outside movements they're making. Are they shaking their arms? Are they, are they stiffening? That's what the clinical start is. And the EEG start is the start of the epileptic uh, activity in the brain on the EEG. So you mark the start for both of those. And then you mark the EEG end where the seizure ends on the EEG. And then you also mark the clinical end when the patient stops their shaking, jerking, stiffening, whatever it happens to be. That's what the, the clinical part is. So, and often they line up, but sometimes they don't line up exactly in the same spot. So interesting to note for the doctor. And of course, they'll have the video and the EEG as well to check it out. But this way, we just make it so simple on the doctors. They will love us. I know the doctors at the hospital I worked at loved me because I gave them all these preliminary reports and made their jobs and lives very easy. So if you want to learn how to read an EEG, whether you're an EEG student, doctor, neurologist, you can go to my website, ioneeg.com. I'll send you 15 EEG examples. All you got to do is go through the examples, spend some time with the EEG, and if you have any questions, just ask me. So thank you guys for watching. Hit the like button. I appreciate it. And I'll see you all on the next EEG video.